Welcome back to another episode of Meet the Creatives. Today I am here with uh, a legend to me, and I know everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time, but as someone who's really into photography, uh, it is an honor and pri privilege to have Art Stryber on the show. Uh, thanks for being here, Art. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. We finally locked it down. Uh, Absolutely. Um, Months in the making. Yes, yes. And it's uh, w well worth the wait. And as I mentioned before the show, it's a kind of an opportune time. I'm absolutely obsessed with uh, photography right now, in particular, um, portrait photography. So who better than to talk to than yourself? That's very kind. So tell me, you know, starting out, how did uh, you get into photography? Is there some sort of like moment where you discovered like a camera and like a, in a basement somewhere? How did you originally come around to photography? Well, I think it's important to just set the, um, set the overall scene, which is that there is no one right way in to photography. Yes. There, there isn't a prescribed track. This isn't med school, this isn't law school. Right. So photographers can come from anywhere and photographers can have a photography background or education going to photo school or not. They can bartend, they can come from modeling, they can, it can become a second career um or a third career so while i am happy to share my story i think it's really really important that your listeners understand that my story isn't their story and the circumstances for my career beginning actually don't exist anymore right. so each of your listeners is making his or her or their own way into the business Yes. So, and again, I will answer the question, but almost more <laughs> no, this, this is really helpful. This is good. This is awesome. almost more importantly is this idea and it's contradictory and it's a yin and yang of ceaseless, tireless, impatient determination balanced with a long-term patience it's patience and impatience. Yes. Because this is a long game and you want to have a long career and you want to evolve. So I, I cannot even begin to list the stumbling blocks and frustrations and um, lost jobs over the course of my career for all kinds of different reasons. But to answer your question. Yes. No, it's very helpful because I, I like to, to kind of, you know, because people see like the finished product, they see the, the master, exactly right. they don't see the climb. So that's, that's I'm exactly trying right. to, I'm trying to cut through some of that today. So it's already off to an amazing start. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> um, my grandfather was a very, very avid amateur photographer. And he had a dark room in his house. And my father had an old Nikon F and I don't remember why I was compelled to shoot a roll of black and white Tri-X film and go to my grandfather's and have him show me how to develop the roll and make prints. And once that happened, I was totally hooked because it was not only magic to see the print come up in the tray, but there was also a process. And the process was, if you do this and you do this and you do this, you get this. My grandfather is an avid amateur. I fell in love with the magic and the process of the darkroom. And I always loved, in elementary school, the field trip. I loved going behind the scenes at the bottling company or the dairy and seeing how the sausage is made. And those three things combined um, really propelled me and compelled me to stick with it. But I will also say that in the very, very beginning, I thought photography was photojournalism. I didn't understand that portrait photography existed. I adored Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, National Geographic. I thought that's what photography was. And I slowly began to understand that, oh, 
there's architectural photography, interior photography, event photography, um, automotive photography, fashion photography, sports photography. So over the course of high school, photo editor of the yearbook and the newspaper, college, photo editor of the Stanford Daily. And then in my early career, I was shooting anything and everything that came my way. I was a journeyman. I was um, uh, shooting in every single genre. And I have to say that all these years later, having the experience of dipping my toes into sports, fashion, reportage, event, travel, interiors, has really informed what I do today and how I do what I do today. Yeah. I became a jack of all trades and a master of none. I love that because that's kind of like where I'm at. And this is so we talk about the stars aligning. This is kind of where, where I'm at in my personal photography journey. You know, I started off uh, actually in the Lightroom. Shout out to Mr. Babic, my uh, my teacher. My my high school had a very, uh, for the time, a very like progressive uh, art based program. Um, or I think that's where they just put me. So I'd like stay out of trouble. I was not in the, the honor society. I was like the artsy kid and working in, in, in the dark room. And then when I got to college, I got into photojournalism. My professor was uh, the guy who, uh, Tom Franklin, who took a picture of uh, firefighters raising the flag on 9-11 where they're pulling up the flag. And the oh, flag. wow. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, it was an absolute master class. And he um, was very um, passionate and, and stern about photography and really was, you know, taught us a lot. You know, I actually learned to shoot manual in that class. But now I find myself... I feel like I need to to pick a lane and I love portrait photography and I think that's a direction that I want to go. Um, but I'm curious to get your take on on that. So somebody who is in the first, uh, professionally speaking, in the first five years of my journey, do you think it's important to pick a lane or do you think it's it's important to kind of stretch all the notions of what you could be as a photographer or, or is that kind of a disservice to yourself because you're not honing your craft in, in one area. There's no right answer to that. Yeah. Meaning, um, you know, let's say that you are just into baking. Right. And you really want to hone your baking. Should you also figure out how to work the barbecue? Right. Should you also figure out how to make uh, pasta? Okay, bad analogy, boiling water, drop in the pasta. My point is- No, I, I got that, you. <laughs> my point is that there is no right answer. You, you here's, here's the one right answer. Uh, okay. An old agent of mine told me years ago that it was her belief that a professional photographer should have three kind of genres to live yes. in. In case one of them goes south, either permanently or for a period of time for whatever reason. Uh, so my answer would be to dive into the thing that really compels you, but be very open and explore a couple of other areas. Yeah. Because here's the thing, I'm a big believer that, like I said, everything that I learned in those other genres informs how I approach my work today. That's number one. Number two is I built a career out of saying yes. Now, other photographers have built careers out of saying no. Does this interest you? No. Is this something you'd like to shoot? No. I said yes every single time to my detriment in some cases, because whether it was my wife, my agent, or my first assistant would say to me, why did you say yes to that? <laughs> and I would say, because they called and asked me, I had what I describe as the Labrador retriever mentality, which is throw the tennis ball, I'll go get it and bring it back. My uncle used to be the 
vice president of major gifts in the athletic department at Stanford University. And so he's dealing with the kinds of people that make major gifts. And he told me that his workflow when the phone rang was to say, the answer is yes, now what's the question? And that just washed over me. And I cannot tell you how many times I have answered the phone and said, absolutely, yeah. Yep, I can do that, I'd love to do that. I'm up the phone and thought to myself, I have no idea how I'm gonna do that. <laughs> yeah. Which leads us to the next step in this career building, which is having the wherewithal to break down a project into bite-sized pieces and having the resources, the database, the contacts to call people and say, how do you do this? I literally, honestly, there, there's, there's two of these examples that stick out. When I was in college, I noticed I was shooting sports and among other things for the student paper. And we were shooting uh, T-Max 1600 film, which is a high speed black and white. But I noticed in Sports Illustrated, and I was a huge fan, and I still am, that it looked like basketball arenas were being lit with strobes. And this is the 1980s. That's when Sports Illustrated first started lighting arenas with strobes. And there was a guy named John Hyatt, John Haight, who was the brother of one of Sports Illustrated's best photographers, Andy Haight. And John's job was to travel around the country and light the arenas. Put the lights up, the game was shot, tear the lights down, go to the next place. Now, every single arena, every arena in this country has at least four, six, eight sets of strobes in the rafters. I called John Haight. There's no email, there's no texting, there's no internet. I got this guy's phone number and said, how do you do that? And he went, oh, here's what you do. Right. Amazing. Having the wherewithal and the resources to make those phone calls, to find the answers. The other example is, in 1989, my uh, wife and I were asked to move to Italy to work for the company we were already working for, Fairchild Publications, and be the Milan bureau chiefs. And the timing of our move was such that within days of our getting there, I had to shoot fashion shows. Not some fashion show in downtown Los Angeles, but Multiple. Armani, Versace, Ferre, Valentino, Dolce Gabbana. And I like, I don't know how to do that. I get nervous just hearing that. That sounds crazy. So <laughs> I called the guy that was already doing it. By the way, let me just say, no autofocus in 1989. And I got this guy on the phone and he said, you're in the back of the room with long glass, 300 to eight, and you're shooting Ectochrome 1600 at about 250 F4. And I said, thanks man. Wow. Now I had the tools, but was that exposure right? Was the exposure consistent? And how do you follow focus a model backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Right. The point of these stories is figure out how to solve this problem that has dropped into your lap. Say yes and do your best to figure it out. I look at someone like yourself and you know you're working with like Lady Gaga and stuff like that and then I have like my portraits that I'm working on that are getting better. But it, it just seems like there's just this like 
huge gap, but I feel like the only way I'm going to do that is, is through persistence. How do you get to a place where you're a working professional photographer and kind of get out of your own way? Because I like to think of myself as having a lot of chutzpah to do it, but I'm scared, to be honest with you. I'm out of excuses. I just need to go. You you brought up a really, really uh, great point, and I want to just make it uh, tangible and physical. Yes. You brought up this idea of the gap between yeah. what you think my work looks like and your work. Right. So how do you bridge that gap? You get okay. two walls, and on one wall, you put all of your inspiration. You're a visual person. You've got to put up your visual aspirations. On the other wall, and, and by the way, those are tear sheets and bad photocopies. Right. On that wall is your work. Your, um, they could be bad copies or crappy eight by tens. And bridging the gap is getting your work to start to look like that work. Yes. Now, I'm not saying copy. I'm saying emulate and interpret. That's idea number one. Idea number two is people who photograph celebrities didn't always photograph celebrities. But the mistake that a lot of younger photographers make when they're shooting portraiture is that they only photograph their friends and beautiful people and models. So your portfolio, your book starts to look like a bunch of young, beautiful people. Mm -hmm. You're not really exploring portraiture of interesting looking people that aren't conventionally beautiful. And here is a phenomenal dirty little secret and a misunderstanding of photographing actors and actresses. They are not easy subjects to photograph. And by that, I mean, actors and actresses, when they work, their entire job is to pretend to be somebody else. When they are in front of a camera, they have lines to recite, blocking to execute, an emotional range to cover. And when they get in front of your still camera, they have none of those tools. I cannot tell you how many actors and actresses have said to me, tell me what you want me to do. Please tell me what you want me to do. Please direct me. Right. So there's this mythology that photographing actors and actresses is easy. Now, some of them are naturals in front of the camera and uh, in front of a still camera. Most of them are not. Wow. That's fascinating. It's huge. So your phenomenally compelling portraiture of all kinds of different people can lead you to photographing actors and actresses if that's what you want it to do. But there is a raft of amazing portraiture out there that has nothing to do with the entertainment industry. So don't get hung up on actors and actresses. Get hung up on, is this an amazing, compelling portrait that is illustrative of some idea or some aspect of this person's personality or uh, gives the viewer some insight into who this person is. Yeah. And do your portrait setup with your camera on a tripod and your light or whatever you want, and then take your camera and move around and screw it up and get them to move and make your portrait move so that you're able to tell a portrait story a couple of different ways. So you're talking about, you know, composition, getting the subject to move around. Um, and I know that sometimes a question, you probably get this a lot, is 
um, you know, is gear important using different lenses? You know, recently I have like a zoom lens and I'm looking to get more into prime lenses. Could you maybe talk about that and how that, that plays a difference? You know, a 35, a 50 and 85, um, how much does that play a role? And I know that there are no rules necessarily, but, um, what is that process like for you when choosing what lens and what gear to get a certain effect? I drove one of my recent interns crazy by saying to her, there are no rules. And that is exactly what you don't want to hear. What you want to hear, what you need to hear is the idea that the lenses, the cameras, the reflectors, the umbrellas, the soft boxes, the scrims, the griffs, the flags, and the nets are tools. Right. Walk into a kitchen, pizza cutter, steak knife, cheese knife, chef's knife, five different kinds of spoons, uh, three different kinds of forks. What's the right tool for the job? What's the best tool for the job? What is the tool that's going to get the job done? If you leave the office and didn't bring the beauty dish and you really thought you were going to light this with a beauty dish, different tools allow you to do different things. So what's really important is to expand your toolkit so that you can problem solve whatever's in front of you and push yourself to try different things. There are things you can do with strobes that you can't do with hot lights. There are things you can do with hot lights that you can't do with strobes. There are things you can do with reflectors that you can't do with strobes. There are things you can do with silver reflectors that you can't do with white reflectors. Right. There's things you can do with a 28 that you can't do with a 50. So expand the toolkit based on the imagery you want to make and what's in your budget. Yeah. The last one is huge. <laughs> it the is. budget is definitely huge. Cause I saw the, uh, I was looking through your Instagram before this and there's uh, that great shoot. I love that shoot by the way with that, uh, with Kevin Hart. I love Kevin Hart as well. His audiobook was amazing, super inspiring. Um, and there's a scene where like you're viewing some of the pictures with him and there are these lights, which I don't even know like, you know, what they're called. I have these sort of like $200 soft boxes that are set up here, doing a pretty good job though. Good bang for the buck, I guess I'd say. Um, but I look at that, that equipment and I'm like, oh my God, I have so far to go. But I, I would imagine over time that it's grown little by little. Um, it wasn't always that way. And I'm sure That's as exactly the client right. us, yeah. it's a slow build, like everything else, it's a slow build. And, but here's the thing, conversely, the Lady Gaga shoot was one head and one umbrella. Really? Oh, yeah. I feel inspired. <laughs> yeah. Um, find that in my Instagram. Yeah. One light, one umbrella. So it's the right tool for the job. And here's the thing. If you had a million dollars and you went out and bought the entire pro photo line and the entire Canon R line and all the lenses. Now what? All you've got is the tools. You still have to know how to use the tools. You still have right. to know where to put the light, how to dial in the light. So it's not about the tools per se. It's about understanding how to use the tools. How long was it before you felt that you were really starting to get into a groove and using all the different equipment? Maybe like, what was the, the first time, like from setting up those initial uh, setups to, to where you are now, like how long? Years. That, yeah. Years. That's good to know. Years. Absolutely years. And, and I will say that I'm still looking at a shoot or a subject and thinking, Softbox or umbrella? Eh, let's try the umbrella. Right. You know, um, but being able to go through my experience, years, going able to, being able to go through my experience and go, let's try this. 
turn that down, move that over here, put that here, try this. That's experience. Yeah. It's experience. Let me throw this at you. Yes. Last week, for five straight days, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., I was at a home in Malibu photographing a um, private art collection. Furniture, tapestries, paintings, uh, cameos, jewelry, uh, crystals, sculptures that ranged from a dining room table down to a Grecian coin. I'm not a still life photographer, but I have done still life photography. And you had to say yes, like you said before. I you're, you're a yes, yes man. <laughs> I'm a yes man. Yeah. I had to say yes. So it was, I was telling somebody about it and, and she said, that sounds excruciating. And I said, no. Oh, by the way, we shot 100, 120 items a day. And some of those items we took one shot of. And they would range from, like I said, something like this that is not reflective. Art is now holding up a stapler. Or <laughs> it, would, it would range to something ceramic filled with reflections. So I had to dive deep into my knowledge and my toolkit to remember how to deal with all of those different kinds of surfaces and scale changes. And I shot a macro lens, I shot a standard lens, I shot a wide lens. But when I was shooting the wide, I couldn't make, I didn't want to make the, um, uh, object tweaky. So mm -hmm. I had to figure out a way to not make the object tweaky. And some of this stuff was so big that we couldn't photograph it. We couldn't bring it to our, by the way, daylight set. Wow. And our daylight set had window light. And then outside the window, when the shrubbery lit up, that light went green. The ceiling is warm. So this was like a um, an episode of Punked, where every <laughs> single thing is coming at you. Yeah. The point is, not that I shoot still lifes. The point is the toolkit. We used strobes, we used reflector cards, we used flags, we used nets, we used silks. Um, it was a blast. Yeah. That must be really exciting to kind of challenge yourself at this point and try and do things that are new. And it's encouraging to hear exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because I look at you and I think like, this guy's got to figure, like, you know, you hear about like mastery, you know, but to hear someone like yourself who was saying like, no, I still get like a little bit anxious about things, a little bit unsure of myself. The mastery is that there is going to be a higher probability that the ball is going to go into the hoop. Yes. Mastery is that there's a higher probability that the shoot will be a success. And that comes from experience. LeBron James, and I am not comparing myself to LeBron. LeBron <laughs> I am. I'll do it for you. There you go. <laughs> no, no, no. LeBron or Tiger know that if they make this move, given all of the input, if they hit the putt this way that there is a really high probability that the ball will go in the hole, that the basketball will go in the net. Right. They don't make a hundred percent of their shots. They don't make a hundred percent of their putts. Their mastery comes from their higher success rate. And that comes from experience and it comes from in their case, not in mine, um, an intuitive um, understanding of the mechanics and the dynamics of the game. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things that I find inspiring about our talk today is recognizing that essentially everything just takes time. 
And I, I've ex- absolutely I, yes. I've experienced that a lot with with this podcast. It's as you know, I'm like a, I'm young in my career. Like I'm meeting all these people. I'm like you know, like what's the secret? And the secret is it's just like pressure and time kind of thing. Um, so I've come to that conclusion. Um, but how long have you been doing the podcast? Uh, four years. What number podcast is this? Um, pro- I don't know. I, I don't count. It's, it's a lot though. I'm, you should. I, it's ADD run riot. I don't- <laughs> well, here's the deal. I can't tell you how many shoots I've done, but in five seconds, I could log in and tell you how many shoots I've done Yeah. in my database. My yeah. point is that four years ago, it's something it- like 250, something like, something like that. There you go. Yeah. Did it, did podcast number one look like this? Oh, it was, it was a shit show. It was terrible. <laughs> Let me go get, let me go get my tear sheets from, um, 1998. Mm -hmm. They are embarrassing. Yeah. No mastery. Yeah. But tell me about that part of it though. And and, and, in your story personally, well, like who was like the first person that you were like, you just go stand over there and then we're going to try and figure it. Like I'm talking real, like, the first time you're like, oh, that's it. I'm a professional photographer. Was it like family? Was it friends? Did you have somebody that you use consistently? I, was, I, I need to get out of that. I need to go out past that now. My, my, my wife is beautiful and she's a great, she could be a model, but I need to push myself to get outside of that, of that zone, you know, cause I'm getting, I feel that complacency and I feel like it's stopping me. Whereas I need to reach out more outreach. Which is weird because I do that all the time with this podcast, but not with photography. I don't know why. Okay, there were only seven questions in there, and we're getting lower. Clear, it's clear now <laughs> that this podcast is free therapy for you, and I commend you on that. Congratulations, you figured out how <laughs> to get free inspirational therapy, and my hat is off to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, to answer your question about me. I was on staff. I graduated from college and I did an internship. I left that internship. I did a traineeship. I freelanced for a year or two uh, while I was working at a camera store. And then I got a staff job. And as a staffer at a newspaper magazine company, I had to shoot whatever they told me to shoot. Right. I had to shoot food. Let me go down the list again. Fashion, <laughs> travel, interiors, portraiture, still lifes. I'm learning on the job, which yeah. you're not supposed to do. Um, and then that same company sent me and my wife to Italy. And we were in Italy for four years and I was doing all of that same stuff in Italian. Damn. It wasn't until we came back in 1993 that I was self-employed and making a career as a self-employed photographer, making a career is totally different than your question, which is how do I stop photographing my beautiful wife? (laughs) And, um, uh, the way that you stop photographing your beautiful wife is to, get off this podcast when we're done, close the door, think about the circles. You're the uh, pebble in the pond. Think about the circles around you of human beings. Are you in New York City? Just outside, I'm in Jersey. Okay. About like 50 minutes outside New York. What town? And Mawa, and Bergen County. Yeah. I'm sure it's (laughs) bad. Okay, so. But there's people around, lots of people, lots of options. Okay, great. Family, friends, neighbors. Is there a town, a township? Yes. Okay. Small, beautiful Americana, right? Yeah, the suburbs. I'm out here in the burbs. Lovely. You have to self-assign portrait projects, portrait series of whomever. I'm not going to tell you who to do but I am going to give you a, a secret, a, um, an inroad to yes. getting your work published. Okay, good. Okay, so let's say that 
for some reason, you are compelled to photograph the um, single store owners, uh, sing, uh, self proprietors. Yes. Not the people who work at um, McDonald's. Right. The guy who owns the dry cleaner. The woman who owns the travel agency. You get the idea. Yes. They are going to be psyched that somebody wants to take their picture. And they are not going to care or understand if you get out a softbox, an umbrella, a strobe, a hot light, a reflector, or no lights. Yeah, they're not going to ask like what like what millimeter lens what, it is. Or what are you like, doing? <laughs> Why are you using the 50? They yeah. don't know and they don't care, which yeah. means all the pressure is off. That's true. All the pressure is off. And now you've built a portrait series of the sole proprietors of Mawa. What's it called? Mawa, yeah, that's right. That's what? a weird name, I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. I grew up in Suffern, which is weirder. Okay. <laughs> I am going to Google Maps because I'm a map freak. It's cool. M-A-W-A? Yeah, sorry, M-A-H-W-A-H. Even weirder, I think it's like Native American or something, I don't know. N A H W A H. It, it it does exist. It's in New Jersey. Uh, oh, an... it is. Hello, uh, it is Native American. There's a reservation right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you're right on the border with New York. Yeah, I grew up in New York, so I moved just over the border. Okay. You got to come by sometime. We got to hang out. We got to. There's Mawa. <laughs> All right. What's the main drag? Uh. Well, there's uh, Franklin Turnpike, which I guess is technically it. Got it. I'm on it. I'm dropping the little man. Oh my God, it's bucolic and beautiful. All right, we're not going to the Gulf or the Sunoco on that corner. Oh, you really are there? Okay, good. <laughs> Dude, I, I take this you know, research very seriously. Okay, there's a psychic. Uh, there's a lot of American flags. Um, oh, yeah. There's the Glamour, the Glamour Paws Boutique. Yes. Uh, little kitchen, martial arts, dude, done, 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 done. Okay. I love this. This is amazing. You're welcome. <laughs> so now I'm sorry for taking this podcast off the rails, but this is really no, no, no. Inspiring this, me. It's good. <laughs> here, here's, here's the deal. While this is immediately about you yes. and Mawa, yes. theoretically, I've been very self-serving today. <laughs> theoretically, your listeners are applying it because here's the deal. Yeah, yeah. You might have this massive extended family. Don't tell me. But one of your listeners might. Mm -hmm. Put up a seamless, photograph them. Writers are told, write what you know. Photographers are never told to photograph what's right under their nose and we take it for granted. Yeah. If you look at my website and you look at the series, you'll see this thing called Neighborhood Noir. And if you read my description, you'll see that is my street, my block at night on an iPhone because I'm walking my aged dog, passed away in December. Sorry the point that. is, it's right under my nose. Mawa is right under your nose. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Self-assign, put together a portrait series. And the homework is, this is just available light. This is just one light. On this assignment, I'm gonna do a tight head shot and I'm gonna do something environmental. Yeah. On this assignment, I'm not bringing a tripod and I'm just gonna follow them around as they do their dry cleaning. The dry cleaner sounds cool. I can kind of envision it already. There you go. Like the, the swooshing, the, yeah, the whole nine yards. There you go. Okay. Maybe, maybe they're, they're like walk. in between the things. I love it. This is good. There you go. You're walking into the dry cleaner and seeing the dry cleaner in a totally different way than what you've been doing for the last 29 years, which is walking in and going, here are my shirts. Right. Okay, so now you're a little bit of a journalist and you're a little bit of a psychologist, sociologist, anthropologist. I okay, love it. so now the secret is that if you are able 
to come up with a portrait series that has some kind of relevant news peg or is, that has some kind of interest to a wider audience, you can get that published. How, what are you talking about? Let me explain. A thousand years ago, I opened up Los Angeles Magazine and there was this phenomenal series of portraits of waitresses who had been at their job for at least 30 or 40 or 50 years. Same job, 30, 40, 50 years. If they started when they were 20, these women were 50, 60, 70 years old. Right. And I went, oh my God, this is amazing. You and I have both been at restaurants and been waited on by a 60 year old waitress. And we just went, thank you, and gave them a tip and left. But somebody went, wait a minute, that's amazing. Right. I'm going to track more of these women down. So I called the magazine, I knew the photo editor, and I said, those portraits are amazing. You know, where did that assignment come from? And the photo editor opened my eyes, the clouds parted, and she said, oh, that was a project that the photographer brought to us. Oh, that's so and I cool. Said, oh, 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 I was waiting for the assignment. You are waiting for the assignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not coming. Exactly. It's not coming. You I love that. have to create the assignment. You have to generate the work. And we are not going down this rabbit hole, but um, here's why that's even more important and easier than it ever was. When I was your age, film, processing, proof sheets, waiting around, making a print, you could shoot this Mawa project next week and it could be on your website next Thursday. I'm gonna do it. That's number one. And number two, creating new work to update your website is huge because otherwise your website is stale. How many people, um, have been to a website, any website, and it's exactly the same as the last time you visited it. And you're like, what, what the hell? Right. Where's the newest, latest, greatest? And the web has created this expectation of novelty and newness and freshness that you have to feed. That was a lot. Yeah. But there you go. I love it. This is so good. Okay. Is there anything in, in closing? And you've been so gracious with your time and I really appreciate you doing this. And, Dude, uh, we've got 10 minutes. Knock yourself out. Ask okay. another question. Okay. All right. Here, I'm going to ask you some. Go back to your list. We're going to do, we're going to do a dumb speed round. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Let's make sure I have everything here. Okay. Here's a question I thought up. Now I feel like I, I made it through the, the brunt of it. Wasn't a total train wreck. I feel pretty good. I hope you feel the same. Uh, let's do so there's some crazy questions that I thought up here. You're going to an island. You're doing the biggest portrait shoot of your life. There's only enough weight allowed. I'm not implying anything here. You can only bring one lens with you, one focal length. And you're, you have to, you're stuck with that to take portraits for the rest of your time at that island. What is that? What is that focal length? What is that lens? The 35. That makes me so happy because my 30th birthday, not to make it about myself again, is on. <laughs> People are going to be screaming at me in the YouTube comments. I'm, I'm, mentally, hope so. I'm mentally prepared. Um, but uh, the 35 millimeter is the, I've been doing all this research and that's what I want to get. Okay. That's good. But you didn't ask me why. Why? Because depending on how you use the 35, it can feel like a 28 or a 50 or even an 85. You get nice and close. Is it like a 1.4? A 1.4 would, you know, be icing on the cake, but you know, you could get the job done with a two or a two eight. Yeah. I should almost just like be humble and get a two eight. Okay. That's good. Um, 
Do you have a preferred um, camera company that you use, Canon, Nikon, or is it is it all over the place? Um, I've been shooting Canon since 1976, when my grandfather, the one with the darkroom, sold me and my brother Paul a Canon AE-1 for $5 and threw in a 50 millimeter lens for $2. Now, why? I'm learning here as I go. Why did you stick with Canon all these years? What was it about that versus- Familiarity. Like yeah. I looked at the Nikon F3 and went, wow, that's powerful. And then Canon came out with the F1. And, you know, over the years, you know, it's a little bit like, I'm not even going to make an analogy, um, <laughs> but six of one, half a dozen of the other. Now, yeah. I will also say that um, over the years, I was very, 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 very into the Mamiya 645. I have the Pentax 6x7 system complete. I have a complete um, uh, Mamiya RZ system. And for digital, I'm going back and forth between the Canon and the Hasselblad. These are tools. They were always tools. They do different things. They serve different purposes. Of all the people that you photograph that are celebrities, is there one that kind of surprised you that stands out? You were like pleasantly surprised. Or you just like adored. Do you have like a favorite? Is there somebody that you love working with the most? That's three. You know, honestly, the surprise comes from how much they're willing to give. Yeah. And the two examples that we have already discussed. Like I had no idea that Lady Gaga was going to essentially do yoga on a stool. That, that was absolutely phenomenal. And by the same token, Kevin Hart can give you just this amazing range of from comedic to smoldering dramatic. Yeah. He gives to the camera and takes direction and wants to explore, you know, a bunch of different sides to his personality. Yeah, I saw that, so that picture, it, you're reviewing them, that's kind of cool. It does come back to this idea of, you know, fearlessness and exploration and... Yeah. Yeah. One more fun, quick question. If, was there ever a time of like a, like a train wreck situation where like you like lost the memory card or like, do you have anything like that of, or does it have, <laughs> are there a lot of them? Um, not as many as there used to be. <clears throat> well, that's good. But back in the day, I would absolutely forget to bring a certain piece of gear or a piece of gear would fail and I wouldn't have a backup. Oh. So that brings me to two brief organizational ideas. Yes. One is make a checklist of your gear. That's cool. It's a piece of paper and a clipboard. I like it though. It's very practical. Make, make a checklist of your gear and before a project, check off what you want to bring, which means that you're already thinking about the homework, you're thinking about <clears throat> what tools you might need. And you will look at this and go, Oh, right. I've got a mini boom. The mini boom could come in very handy. Yeah. That's part one. Part two is have backups on the stuff that goes down fast. Yeah. So like shooting with dual memory cards and having like two different, this is something I've been exploring this week. And this is my last question. I swear to God. Uh, I'm when, good. When you have, so when you get, so when you're done with the shoot, what is that, that backup process? Like without getting too into like the nitty gritty of things, but I saw some people, they have like multiple, I guess it's called like a raid system, like backup hard drives and stuff like that. You're totally doing dangerous. These, yeah. Well, how do I do that? How do, what's the best way of ensuring that I don't screw this up when I get, when get I finally get the picture? Paper. Yeah. Get out a pen and paper or a keyboard. Right. And um, look up digital fusion. I got it. Right digital fusion.net. Digital fusion. 
And what you are looking at uh, in yeah. particular is their online editing suite called DF Studio. DF Studio. And when your shoot is done, you upload the JPEGs, the TIFFs, and the RAWs into your DF Studio account. After you've named all the files, organized all the files, and they will live there forever. And you will be able to access those files from anywhere on the planet Earth that you can get online. And they are not going anywhere. My digital archive has been with Digital Fusion for 15 years, and I've been a client of theirs for 20 years. That's amazing. DF Studio. Right now, if you said, Art, let's see the Lady Gaga shoot with a few clicks of my mouse and my keyboard, I can show you the entire shoot. That's so cool. Not only that, I can show you my first selects from the shoot. I can show you the finals from the shoot. What do you use because when you're doing that? Like, do you use like Bridge or Photo Mechanic? Is there like a certain? Capture One. Capture, I'm, writing, I'm writing this down. Capture One. Okay. We left on a very practical note. I feel good. This is amazing. Absolutely. Oh my God. Okay. This has been, this has been so much fun. Uh, where can people find you online? What's the best place to get in touch? Um, art at artsdriver.com yes. uh, is the email. Artsdriver.com is the website. AS pictures is the Instagram. Awesome. And thank you to your team for helping to facilitate this. I think uh, Evan was the Evan, right? Evan, my studio yes. manager. Evan, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I was, uh, all over the place with the scheduling, but we got it Not done. We, we crossed the finish line. We're here. We I met one of my heroes today. Was, oh, that's was, very sweet. Thank you very awesome. much. All right. Thank you so much. And Congratulations. All, uh, and yes. I want to see the Mawa um, retailer's portrait series. I'm going to do it. I'm going to send you some pictures. I'm going to hold myself to it. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been really great. All right, man. All right. Take care. Thank you for having me. No worries. Bye. Bye-bye.